Hey yo, what is going on, viewers of the tube? If it's your first time here, I'm your host, Tyler, and welcome to the only crypto channel that can make differing projects supporters who fight. <laughs> come together at my cute side. You know our force. It's time for Chico Crypto. Well, of course, no one is talking about it, but the Chico channel isn't going to let this slip into obscurity until the bomb goes off. What am I talking about? A new document, of course, right here, filed by the New York AG, Leticia James, which I showed on my live stream last Friday, and we will get into in a bit. But first, a quick summary of why this is important, since I have talked about this so much. Bitfinex and Tether messed up big time by hooking up with a shady payment processor, Crypto Capital, who lost $800 million doing dirty business like laundering funds for international drug cartels. Bitfinex and Tether allegedly tried to cover this up, so the New York AG obtained an order to prevent them from draining company accounts and hiding the loss of corporate and client funds. This was all in April, but in May, the New York AG received that order from the Supreme Court, and it prevented BFX from further depleting the cash reserves and to produce documents and information central to the AG's investigation. Instead of complying with the order, Bitfinex and Tether decided to fight back, and luckily I found this case text document of what happened so far. According to official case transcription, later in May the 16th, the defendants or respondents motioned to dismiss or vacate the April 24th order. As we can see, this was denied. <laughs> They just thought he had an advantage against Matthews, obviously. Nice little spin. Although the injunction did get modified as not to necessarily interfere with the legitimate business activities, which was a win for Tether and Bitfinex as they could continue to operate. Well, Tether, they weren't satisfied. They filed for a second motion to dismiss the case in August of this year. Supreme Court Judge Joel Cohen, just like the first time, denied their motion to dismiss on the basis of lack of jurisdiction. Well, Bitfinex and Tether appealed this decision again, and they actually kind of won another decision in court, when in October, Judge Cohen denied the New York AG's request for Bitfinex to comply with turning over documents during the appeals trial. Although just below his decision, Joel says the court injunction is extended until the hearing and determination of the appeal. So that is where we are at. Bitfinex and Tether had until November 4th to perfect and submit their appeal to the appellate court, which will be heard for the January 2020 term. And Bitfinex, they did get that filed. Here is their submitted document to the appellate court, claiming the New York AG does not have jurisdiction over them. Well, the New York AG had some time to look this over and then submit their argument document, which is the one I showed in the beginning. This was filed in the appellate court on December 4th. So they got a month to construct their argument. And here are the juicy details. The OAG's investigation is not limited to tethers. It also centers on the operation of the Bitfinex platform, which allows trades on nearly 100 other virtual currencies, any of which may be a security or commodity. So it's the whole platform they're going after, not only tether, the lifeblood of the crypto markets. And this next part is important. Their arguments about OAG's investigatory authority and personal jurisdiction fault OAG for having insufficient evidence about Tether's status as a security or commodity and about respondents' contacts with New York. But respondents have persistently refused to produce the OAG documents bearing on these questions. It is deeply perverse for the subject of an investigation to deliberately withhold material documents and then fault OAG for not having enough facts. No principle or case law allows a suspected wrongdoer to kill an investigation by stonewalling it. So they're saying Tether isn't providing the necessary documents, which would answer the question if they had customers in New York, meaning the New York AG does have jurisdiction. And the one piece of evidence the New York AG has put forward shows that Mike Novogratz of Galaxy Digital might have had an account with Bitfinex. 
Exhibit 6, produced by the New York AG in July, shows that Galaxy Digital did submit an application to be onboarded as a customer of Bitfinex in October of 2018. So this evidence is just a letter of application to be a customer, and that is why the New York AG wants more documentation. Was Galaxy Digital a customer of Bitfinex? Literally, that is the question, and the answer to it is going to either let Tether continue to operate into the future or go collapse in a spectacular fashion. And come January, we will find out if the New York AG gets access to the documents they want. And this Tether stuff leads me into what I want to circle back to next, a mysterious death of one of the world's first crypto billionaires. In May of 2018, Matthew Mellon suspiciously died of an apparent overdose in Mexico. Matt was the heir to the Mellon banking fortune and throne. He was an early investor in Bitcoin and amassed a major fortune in Ripple during the 2017 bubble, pushing him into the crypto billionaire status. Now, Tether and Bitfinex were connected to Matthew and BNY Mellon in late 2017, early 2018. All Tether banks used BNY Mellon as a custodian of funds. I made a video on this before, the mysteries behind his death and how it could possibly relate to Tether and Bitfinex. That video is in the description if you want to check it out. But there are some new connections and I'm going to drop this information right now. So Brock Pierce's Noble Bank and Markets, which served as Bitfinex's bank in 2017 and 2018, used BNY Mellon as a custodian. This information became public knowledge in March of 2018, when BitMEX Research dropped the bomb and connected Noble right back to Tether and operating out of Puerto Rico. And then from Noble's own blog post describing their bank operations. This means that MBI does not lend or rehypothecate client assets, lol. Rather, assets are legally segregated in the name of the client and bankruptcy remote, held at MBI's global custodian, BNY Mellon. So it's confirmed, Tether, Noble Bank, and BNY Mellon's relationship. But here's some more evidence I just found which confirms it as concrete. From official evidence in the hands of the New York AG, Tether invested in stock purchases of Noble Series A. Per my discussion with John, John Betts, today we are back on for a $2 million investment in the Series A round. Our GC, Stu Hogner, is CC'd. Please send him subdocs. We will be doing the investment in the name of DigiFedEx Inc. But it gets even more interesting. This email sent from John Betts to Giancarlo Devancini, Philip Potter, and Stu. I would like to get on a call with you and discuss the Tether situation and how we can work together to get ahead of this issue. The recent articles, aka negative Tether, Bitfinex, and Solvency ones in late 2017, have come up to the attention of our board, and there is concern that if not handled correctly, that it can cause blowback on Noble and could negatively affect our relationship with BNY Mellon. I have been instructed to get ahead of the curve on this. This email was sent on December 8th, 2017, and from this archived article, only 13 days later, on December 21st, Bitfinex and Tether had to close new account registration and no longer accepted any new users, which went on for another month, but by January of 2018, they announced they are open again. I wonder why. Guess who in February of 2018 set up Global Trading Solutions, LLC? and set up bank accounts under the company's name with HSBC, Reginald Fowler of Crypto Capital. So what does this have to do with Matthew Mellon and his death? Well, Noble Tethers Bank lost their relationships with BNY Mellon, and who was their middleman keeping that relationship alive? Of course, Matthew Mellon. I don't believe for a second it was an overdose in Cancun. He was sober a week before, posting pictures on Instagram, so sober, so happy. The drug rehab facility called him. He didn't call them and request he come to Mexico. A rehab facility called him for an emergency treatment follow-up. Then the first reports of his death came out. They said he died at the treatment facility after taking a hallucinogenic treatment drug. Those were the first reports. Then the treatment facility tweets that this didn't happen and he never made it to the facility. 
From this Page Six article, on Monday, a rep for Mellon's family said the troubled financer died suddenly while attending a drug rehabilitation facility. But on Tuesday, they changed their statement, saying Mellon died in Cancun, where he was planning to check into a rehabilitation facility for follow-up treatment. So just right there, you know something is not making sense. Matthew had his bodyguards with him, and they knew his family. How in the hell did they tell his family he died at rehab? How did they get the story so wrong that it took 24 hours to get it right to his family in a world of instant connections via cell phones and the internet? And Matthew's body? Did the Mellons ever get their son a true autopsy and toxicology report to get full closure of what happened? According to this New York Times article written days after his death, J. Reeve Bright, Matthew's stepfather, said, Mr. Mellon's family is awaiting results of an autopsy and toxicology test being conducted by the Mexican government. What did the Mexican government actually do with the body? From this NZ Herald article, after the post-mortem examination of which the only thing they could determine was that he died of unnatural causes, Mellon's body was taken to Breton Funeral Home, where he was cremated and his ashes sent to his family in America. So they threw him in an incinerator and sent his family the ashes. Evidence destroyed. Page 6 confirms it once again. No autopsy conducted. But you need more suspicions? Well, Matthew Mellon, after his first Satoshi Roundtable meeting in early 2014, was named to the Chamber of Digital Commerce as executive chairman. What was his role? Mellon will focus on growing the level of bank involvement in the Bitcoin industry, as well as supporting initiatives that enable conversations between the Bitcoin space, members of Congress, and financial industry leaders, according to the Washington, D.C.-based Bitcoin Advocacy Group. But I wonder who is still involved with this group to this day? Who took Mellon's role as chairman? Matthew Rozak did. And looky here, Matthew was also on the board of Noble Markets, aka Noble Bank. And from this 2014 article, Sunlot Holdings and its public face, John Betts, also for Noble Bank of Markets, were trying to buy the defunct Mt. Gox Exchange. Brock Pierce, who leads Sunlot Holdings, and Matthew Rozak, and William Quigley. And just look who is still involved with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, even though the heir to the fortune is dead. BNY Mellon. And do you think BNY Mellon has slowed down or stopped their involvement with crypto after Matthew's death? Nope. Just last week, we find out they were the custodian for the Telegram ICO. In April of this year, we find out they were the custodian for BACT. Shoot, even on their website, they are major proponents of crypto and custodianship. Well, look at this 2014 Forbes article written about the Mellon family and fortune. Of America's billion dollar dynasties, only the DuPonts are having a longer run, and they have a dominant family company perpetually generating the wealth. Not so with the Mellons, who have a flaky heirs like Matthew plowing millions into fashion labels and Bitcoin startups. You have nonetheless maintained a 12 billion fortune. And here is what stinks. Just a couple months after Matthew's death, the BNY fam moved further into crypto. July of 2018, Jeff Horowitz was named Chief Compliance Officer for Coinbase. And of course, Jeff is former BNY Mellon boss. Coincidence or something more? Well, I'm going to keep investigating and digging, and I hope that everyone else sees that there is much more to this mess. There's so much more to Tether, Noble Bank, Bitfinex, even the New York AG, and even now BNY Mellon. This is something we can all get together on to figure out. Cheers. I'll see you next time.